Hi, this is Hosep Bhartia, and we are here at Open Source Summit in Vancouver. Today we have with us once again, Gabriele Colabro. You wear many hats. Uh, the two hats that we're going to talk about today is Executive Director of Finos and also General Manager of LF Europe. First of all, Gabriel, it's once again great to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me here. It's always a pleasure. Yeah, uh, let's talk uh, about Finos. You know, we earlier you know, touched upon that when we are in Dublin. But give us some update on the project foundation. You know, this year... Uh, of course, it's a pretty complicated year for financial services. We've all heard, you know, the news. Uh, but uh, it's interesting to note that uh, the project is going as fast as it's ever grown. Um, we've had the fastest growth in the last year in terms of contributors and, of course, con- members. Um, and even further, is accelerating. This year, the first quarter, we had about 20% contributor growth quarter over quarter. So it's been, uh, you know, pretty substantial, I think, recognition of the fact that, you know, open source is counter-cyclical when, um, you know, the economic climate is complex, when organizations are pushed to be more efficient and more innovative. Actually, open source, even in a conservative industry like financial services is definitely seen as a, a way to accelerate uh, those. And so I'm, I'm really pleased to see the you know, growth in contributors, growth in membership. This week we have announced uh, Fidelity Investments joining uh, Finos uh, as a member. Um, you know, uh, we are effectively seeing uh, in terms of our membership uh, in a way, uh, uh, our members following the uh, um, value chain. You know, we start from uh, investment banks. Uh, we are now moving into asset managers like Fidelity. Uh, we are seeing card processors. We have seen Discover this week at this event having a big present. They became a Finos member earlier in the year. So I am very pleased to see, you know, the growth uh, that again, such a conservative industry like financial services is seeing in, in open source. You wear a couple of hats, but let's just keep at the Finos hat. Uh, what is your presence here at the Open Source Summit? So we actually had uh, many members representing us. Uh, uh, I was the only representative of Finos uh, here this week. Um, but we have, uh, uh, again, seen our members taking the lead from us and spreading the word. Finos has been mentioned in multiple presentations. We have a lot of, um, you know, uh, in the last two weeks, we actually ran two hackathons, which is a pretty new thing for, uh, you know, banks to get in the same room together developing. Uh, In fact, last week in New York, we had over 100 people uh, hosted the Bank of Montreal, uh, building real solutions that actually were open source uh, in nature. I think that's a big difference. Uh, You see a lot of uh, generally hackathons, tech sprints in this industry that are not open. And so having the opportunity of start in the open with the sort of insurance high longevity, ensuring high longevity to some of these projects is, is really amazing. And in fact, I got to send a shout out to um, Discover as well, who ran a global accessibility hackathon uh, 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 over the last two weeks. Uh, we're waiting for the results. Uh, it's been amazing. We had over 200 participants. It was co-sponsored by Finas. Um, again, I think this is a true recognition of how the industry is opening and, and starting to behave more like you know, tech companies. And of course, little personal note, I, I have a special needs kid. So uh, accessibility topics when I'm able to really uh, sort of bring together my personal, my professional life are definitely, you know, very, very close to my heart. If you look at this, some of this financial industry, or we, I talked to Discover also, some yeah. of these organizations are in a very early, they are going through their own digital transformation. Yes. And there is so much code to be written that sometimes that transformation becomes a deterrent because the code has to be reduced. Can you also talk about, you know, that what role can open source play there? Because this, this code is not where they're competing. They're competing on services. Absolutely. So talk about, you know, what value open source can bring to these organizations where yeah. they should leverage this code for a lot of commodity software, and then they can continue to compete in the market when it comes to bring actual value. Absolutely. I think you, you nailed it. Um, and this is actually something that is going to be a really nice segue into the LF Europe conversation. I am seeing a very strong uh, development in vertical foundations like ours, you know, focused specifically around an industry, around the business problems of a certain industry. And it's always a combination of, on one hand, education. You're right. Some of them are undergoing the digital transformation. 
And within this process, some of them do understand already that open source is a major factor. Some others need education. And in fact, Finos has a major open source readiness program that really helps you know, the community, the industry at large in financial services, but certainly our members to accelerate sort of this strategic understanding. Of course, to your point, um, there are, I think, a couple of levels of value that these organizations get from open source. The first one is the one that we are probably all familiar with, you know, the technical benefits of open source. Uh, we're talking about cost efficiency, we're talking about uh, faster innovation, we're talking about better interoperability in an industry that is effectively connected by nature, meaning you have to transact with your counterparts and potentially collaborate with your competitors uh, to do business in financial services. That's, that's the nature of the financial services industry. Which brings me to the second level. We are now seeing more and more of our projects, given our vertical nature, delivering direct value to the business in these organizations. So if you are a bank on the sell side that is trying to interact and transact with the buy side, you know, with asset managers like Fidelity, we have standards like FDC3 on the API side and the common domain model on the data side that really make this interaction very, very uh, uh, seamless. And then number three, to your point, they are starting to learn from a cultural perspective and really sea level perspective that not all they do is differentiating. There is a lot, like we know in tech, probably 70, 80% of their stack that is really about common problems that we could and should all collaborate on uh, in the open. Let me give you an example. One of our three strategic initiatives is called Open RegTech. It's about open source regulatory technology. Um, if you think about what open source is about, to your point, is work on things that are non-competitive, work on things for which there are common requirements for all the parties, and work on things that ideally, uh, uh, you know, you get a mutualization of the cost by collaborating on. And compliance and regulation really hits these three points. And so you're absolutely right. There has been a sort of an up-leveling of open source in these organizations from just being a sort of a mere uh, way of collaborating on code to truly becoming a strategic pillar of the digital transformation. When we look at the financial industry, you know, uh, it, it also is like very good at following its tenders. Absolutely. Uh, you know, a lot of, you know, of course, uh, uh, there's compliance issue also, but if you look at things like SIFT code, you know, so this industry also understand the importance yes. of such, and this is what open source does. You know, a lot of industries, open source has kind of created standards that, you know, everybody's following without going to an ISO body. Absolutely. I, um, I think you nailed it here, uh, Spapnil, because the reality is, this is an industry that, as we said before, has to collaborate by nature. And so standards like, it's very familiar with standards like FIX, like SWIFT, uh, the very fabric of this uh, um, industry works based on common standards. Uh, let alone, you know, how you report back to like, regulators. That gives a major benefit to regulators to be able to represent, you know, securities and financial instruments in the same format. In fact, again, one of our major projects is called the Common Domain Model, and it was contributed by three industry associations, uh, uh, ISDA, ICMA, and ISLA, which were effectively trade bodies, trade organizations, building standards for the industry, and they've now realized that open source can accelerate the adoption of that standard. I, you know, I work both in standard bodies and in open source organizations, and really you get the best of both worlds when you pair you know, an established open standard with open source implementations, bindings, uh, things that you can actually put in the hands of a developer in a super frictionless way. Because otherwise the alternative is you either have to implement the standard yourself and, you know, who knows if you do it right or whether you are 95% compliant, which effectively means you're not compliant, uh, or you have to rely on a vendor to build that standard for you. And again, we all remember the browser wars and uh, you know how it happened. You know, you had to have Chrome and and Firefox come into the the, the uh, field to actually 
you know, move past that, that sort of browser world world and drastically improve the user experience and the, just the, the standardization of the web. So you, you absolutely are right. I think open source brings uh, collaboration in financial services to a whole new level. You bear so many different heads. Now I will talk about LF Europe. We sat down, I think, two weeks ago at yes. KubeCon and we got an update. But talk a bit about, because you, uh, I think there are some things that you gave me a glimpse of things that are in the pipeline. Yes. So how many of those things are have reached the fruition? Let's talk about Yes. That. I mean, we move fast. And uh, uh, as you can see from my face, I'm pretty tired. But we've had some exciting uh, updates in the last couple of weeks. Well, first of all, we announced announced our Linux Foundation Advisory Board, Linux Foundation Europe Advisory Board um, last week. Uh, I'm really excited to have over 20 leaders from European organizations, both uh, you know, technology companies like SAP or Dynatrace or uh, all the way to uh, uh, big industrial companies like Orange or Bosch or uh, um, um, Alice, uh, we have really great representation of actually over 10 countries in Europe. That's also something that I'm, I'm pretty excited about, you know, uh, to really have a diverse representation uh, uh, of the different needs of Europe. You know, in the end, differently than the US, we're talking about 27 member states just in the EU. And if you add to that, you know, UK, Switzerland, the rest of Europe, we're talking about potentially quite different priorities. So having an advisory board really will help grounding um, the focus and the priorities of LF Europe. Um, the second thing that I'm, I'm very excited about uh, is uh, um, you know, our work on the UN Sustainable Goals. You can see my nice pin here. Uh, um, this morning I, I talked about it during my keynote, um, following the announcement from Hilary Carter, our uh, uh, head of research uh, yesterday. Uh, we have launched an initiative to really align the uh, Linux Foundation projects to the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, I think this is important not only as an individual because I'd like to see progress made and I think open source has uh, a unique uh, capability of solving very complex global problems, but also because these are problems that are global in nature and so really speaks volumes to the role of the Linux Foundation and why we created the Linux Foundation Europe. Um, there is a, uh, you know, our tagline is uh, collaborate locally, innovate globally. Uh, so the idea of launching Linux Foundation Europe was really to be able to start projects in Europe. And, you know, Europe cares a lot about social uh, and, and collective uh, societal improvements through open source. But of course, then not creating silos, not creating a fragmentation, uh, but really focus on higher order problems. And I think I'm really pleased to see, and this I think is going to be a message that resonates a lot with Europe, uh, what we can solve through open source uh, of these very large problems like you know climate, water, poverty. Uh, I'm really excited to see the focus on our mission and impact uh, from Linux Foundation and Linux Foundation Europe. You talked about poverty, but sometimes when we talk to folks, it can go beyond that also. Yes. Uh, like I was talking to Hillary this morning as well, and it uh, it could be about the the sustainability of this planet, yes. but also sustainability of open source projects also, because uh, you know, gone are the times where people used to work in their free time. You know. Yes. Uh, at the same time, uh, financial also matter. Diversity, inclusion also matter yes. because of the community. So if I ask you, when you look at these sustainability goals, what are what, because you know once again there are seventeen, you know, but yes. from your perspective, what are the goals that you for LF Europe that you say, hey, these are the immediate priorities that we should look at? Sustainability of the open source community is a major conversation in and of its own, and I think you're absolutely right. There is, um, it is definitely a high priority for Linux Foundation Europe, uh, and maybe we get to talk about. Uh, the CRA, the Cyber Resilience Act, and sort of some of the inadver inadvertent effects that, uh, despite being well intentioned, it might create an open source on an already strained open source community. Um, but when I think about, um, you know, when I look at the portfolio of the Linux Foundation and I think about some of the key projects that we have that are uh, Europe strong, let's say, and aligned with sustainable goals, uh, what comes to mind is certainly LF Energy. Um, it is already 
very active, very, uh, you know, well uh, structured in Europe, you know, RTE, Aleander. Uh, so some of the major providers of energy from Europe are at, in there and they're making, you know, fantastic progress towards energy efficiency. Um, I think OS Climate, uh, open source climate is uh, another very SDG aligned project that it is global in nature. It is not just a Linux Foundation Europe project, but it has a very strong representation from Europe. The climate is of course a global problem, but uh, there is a major focus in Europe, uh, um, especially in Northern Europe, I would argue, uh, to really be aggressive uh, about the issue. Uh, and I think a third one that I don't think gets talked enough about is AgStack. Uh, it's our agriculture uh, ag tech, if you want, uh, open source effort. This is an area that, you know, not only in Europe, but if you think also about India and you think about, you know, the broader uh, uh, issue, not only has a potential to massively improve uh, the conditions, the working conditions of uh, many people in the world, but actually uh, does very closely connect to climate. Um, we all know that the carbon credit system is, is certainly, um, you know, a great attempt, uh, but it's quite easy to game uh, in the sense that there are no standards, there's very little traceability. And so AgStack actually does provide and is starting to providing a lot of tools uh, to really ground some of those measurements in the ground. Sorry for the play on word here. Um, and so I'm, I'm really excited to see later in the year uh, at our open source summit in Europe, uh, in Bilbao, as well as our first Linux Foundation Europe membership summit. We'll have some of these projects very much featured uh, because not only they deliver to individuals, not only I think there are plenty of corporates that are looking to in invest in these areas, uh, but it very much aligns also with the EU goal and potentially public sector funding and uh, you know grants that are coming down that could really help accelerate the speed of some of these projects. Since you briefly touched on you know uh, CRA Cyber Resil Resiliency Act, I do want to you know talk a bit about because last time also we touched briefly about that, but yeah. this is becoming a very hot topic. So yes. I do want to kind of highlight to our audience also uh, what is the challenge and problem there and what role can LF Europe play there. Absolutely. So, well, thanks for the question. Um, so the Cyber Resilience Act, in short, for those who don't know it, uh, is a uh, regulation that is making its way through the legislative process in, in the EU. Um, it is meant, and it has a very noble intent, to bolster cybersecurity uh, in Europe, you know, we all know what happened last year with Lock for Shell. We have seen the response both from the White House uh, with the cybersecurity strategy, and now Europe is is following suit by really trying to regulate um, to enforce security on software uh, and, of course, open source software. Now. Whilst open source is a major pillar of the uh, uh, vision of Europe and the EU for uh, you know a next generation internet, for a human-centered internet, on the other hand, unfortunately, the law as is drafted right now, um, it risks to impose pretty strong liability burdens uh, um, on individual maintainers on foundations, on the very fabric of open source, meaning, uh, uh, you know, repositories, uh, 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 code repositories and binaries repositories. So all the intermediaries that actually offer services for free to the open source community, think about GitHub, think about Maven Central. Um, and so uh, we are indeed concerned that the law as drafted could really mean uh, you know, in the worst case scenario, uh, really backfire towards the EU, meaning they're really investing in open source, they see open source as a major pillar. Again, in the worst case scenario, should open source, should the, a, a developer decide to keep things private because of liability and the risk in Europe, should, you know, a foundation, and I'm not talking in particular about the Linux Foundation, but even the smaller foundations out there, or even projects that are just in GitHub, that are not under a foundation, 
should they have been uh, required, will they be required to have a pretty onerous and frankly currently not very specified set of requirements around security. And so we are working very, very hard uh, uh, with uh, the other nonprofit foundations in Europe, uh, individual contributors, and directly with you know, the European Parliament, European Commission, to, to really try to educate them on uh, what are the potentials uh, should the, the, the law go into effect as is. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, we are seeing, honestly, some, some progress uh, in the last few weeks. Uh, but as you know, it's a very convoluted uh, legislative process and we are not lobbying organizations. There is no, you know, one interlocutor that they can talk to. And so we are all really trying to, to um, work better together with the European Commission. And we're very, very, um, you know, uh, open uh, to, to provide real-life models of what this could mean. Uh, because ultimately, both as a, a professional, I care about the impact this could have to, to open source. But as an Italian citizen, I'm equally uh, worried as to what can that mean for European technology if all of a sudden this might mean that Europe gets isolated from the you know, global open source innovation. So. Uh, yeah, lots to lots to keep us busy in the next couple of months. Gabriel, once again, thank you so much for sitting down with me and give us an update on, you know, of course, uh, LF Europe. And, you know, once again, you know, there are so many things on your plate, but I would love to chat with you again soon to get updates on all these projects that you're working on. But I really, really, really appreciate your time to thank you. Thank you so much, Swapna.